let's say Japan or China or Taiwan, or they produce a widget, they sell it to the U.S., and that means that meant a job left America. It went overseas, but they sell us the widget we used to produce. But that money, the U.S. dollar, then goes into their economy. So let's say a U.S. dollar enters, you know, a Japanese bank or a China bank or a Hong Kong bank. That dollar booms. They have to lend it out again. This was going to be extremely deflationary for the United States. All the manufacturing jobs were going to move out of the country, which would be very bad for the American middle class. Um, but I also saw from what was happening in Asia that their economic booms were driven by their trade surpluses and by the credit explosion that those trade surpluses permitted. As the trade surplus money went into their banks, their banks were able to lend many times more than that, creating great uh, credit booms that eventually turned into great credit bubbles that eventually all blew up in 1997. And then all the pieces came together and it became pretty clear that the same thing was going to happen in the U.S. We could see these bubbles blowing up all over the world because they were selling us Sonys or Toyotas or whatever they sell us. The dollar, the U.S. dollar was going into their system but it was blowing their system into these huge booms. So it was, it was so distorted because of the fractional reserve banking system. And that two people understood what we were talking about. That's right. The, the, the money goes into their banks, and those banks are able to lend it out multiple times. So that created extraordinary credit bubbles, Japan being the greatest example of all. All of these Asian countries, normally under normal circumstances, laissez-faire, all of the money going into these countries would have pushed up the value of their currency. As their exporters change their dollars into yen, for instance, that should have pushed up the yen. But they didn't want their currencies to appreciate because that would have killed their export-led growth. So their central banks created trillions of dollars and bought all of those dollars with this newly created money of theirs. And once they... Once the central banks bought those dollars, their central banks invested them in U.S. government bonds or Fannie Mae bonds or corporate bonds or stocks. And all of that paper money that these other central banks were creating, trillions of dollars, came back into the U.S. and blew the U.S. into a big bubble. And that bubble blew up in 2008. It's a thing called Treffin's Dilemma. Treffin's Dilemma took place in 1944 when the U.S. dollar became the reserve currency of the world. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. And what that meant was the U.S. dollar was screwed anyway. So one of these, I'm a gold bug and a silver bug and a Bitcoin bug and all this. I just don't trust the Fed. And all these people say, oh, don't fight the Fed, you know, ride with the Fed. They're full of it. We always have to run a deficit. And now we can't run it much longer. So more than inflation or deflation is that the euro dollar market is now has the index has inversion. Every time that has happened, something bad is happened. That's what I'm concerned about. Well, so in 2008, when this bubble did blow up, I expected I, that it would blow up. It did blow up, but I expected when it blew up that there would be a depression. But what we saw instead was the U.S. government borrowed trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and pumped it into the economy. And the Fed created $3.6 trillion during the first three rounds of quantitative easing and bought those government bonds, financing that government debt. If the Fed had not bought those bonds, if the Fed hadn't created all that money, the government couldn't have borrowed so much money without pushing interest rates to an extremely high level. All of that government borrowing would have pushed interest rates up, and the very high interest rates would have crushed the economy and done even more harm than the government spending did good supporting the economy. And so this combination of trillions of dollars of government borrowing and spending and trillions of dollars of money creation by the Fed to finance the government spending they reflated the bubble. The bubble didn't implode. It just got bigger. 
So suddenly, the Chinese, Japanese, Thai, Vietnamese, they're owning America. It's the same problems that affect America will fire back into China, Japan, and all that. If their currency gets too expensive, they lose jobs too. So it was that one, what Richard predicted, and correct me if I'm wrong, that China would have the same problem because of the lower price, lower wage countries would then take jobs away from the Chinese. Something like that. Is that correct, Richard? Well, China's beginning to experience that now. The more jobs are going in countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh. Pakistan. So China's wages have gone up and you know, that's making China less competitive. But, but nevertheless, China has benefited so uh, phenomenally from their trade surplus with the U.S. over the years that they've been able to take that trade surplus money and invest it not only in Chinese infrastructure, but in things like 5G and hypersonic missiles. So they have 5G and hypersonic missiles, and we don't because they've been investing so aggressively in these new technologies. And I've been in Zimbabwe, and I've seen the compounds the Chinese have built there because when the economy crashed, the Chinese moved in, and they're taking out the resources. I was in Panama when I was watching Chinese negotiate to build a bigger Panama Canal to beat the U.S. Panama Canal. And I was in Cameroon when I saw them trenching. You know, they were trenching fiber optic cable all across Cameroon. They were also thinking of building a road across South America. And so what China is doing is building infrastructure. And also the other thing that is my, my gold mine in 1999 was in China. And they needed gold, so they took it. So I don't know if Americans know what's going on. It has really nothing to do with Joe Biden or Trump and all this, they can't protect you. But I travel the world, I see Chinese guys all always in Cameroon, Africa. Man, they're, they're dropping in uh, fiber optic cables all across Africa. I'm going, holy mackerel. And what America's doing, we're sending troops. They're sending engineers to foreign countries. Sadly, all of the credit that's been created in recent decades the, the economy has become addicted to credit growth. If, if credit doesn't grow by at least 2% a year adjusted for inflation, the U.S. goes into recession. So we have become addicted to credit growth. And the amount of total credit in the country is so large now that only government borrowing can, keep it make, can make it continue to grow. The private sector just doesn't have enough uh, income to service enough debt to make credit keep growing. So we've really reached the point where the future depends on how much the government borrows and how much money the Fed creates to finance that borrowing. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. 
They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.